Hi everyone, this is Miriam Naime from Newcastle University and the Alan Turing Institute. Welcome to our SuperGen Smart Charging webinar series. The webinar is an activity of the Vehicle Grid Integration Group at the Alan Turing Institute. The Turing is the national institute in the UK for data science and artificial intelligence. And one of the objectives of the institute is to apply data science methods to help solve real world problems, such as what we are doing at the Vehicle Grid Integration Group, where we are supporting the decarbonization of transport and electricity infrastructure. On the webinar, we had uh, uh, several episodes covering communication protocols for the electric vehicle ecosystem, cybersecurity, and also uh, regional and national strategies for electric vehicle and charging infrastructure. If you wanted to access the previous episodes, you can search for Smart Charging Webinar and our landing page containing the YouTube playlist link should pop up. Without further ado, today I'm delighted to host Anurag Sharma, an assistant professor at Newcastle University Singapore campus, and Sumit Madampath, senior power system engineer at Amplitude Consultants. Anurag and Sumit has an extensive experience in power systems, energy management, and distributed energy resources. And today they will talk to us about uh, the plans for decarbonizing Singapore. Anurag, Sumit, over to you. Thank you, Miriam. Uh, this is Sumit speaking here. I will share my... I hope I can see the screen now, right? The presentation. Yes, I can see it. Okay, so um, thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for this opportunity to present this uh, web, uh, as part of your webinar. So the topic today is uh, decarbonizing Singapore industry directions and research opportunities. I mean, uh, we'll be talking broadly about the high level plans of uh, Singapore government and also the industrial activities and other research opportunities happening out of this uh, effort. So the presentation is uh, divided into two parts. First, uh, myself, Sumit will be speaking about the context of uh, Singapore, like what, how the power system is and uh, what is the current status and how it is heading. And uh, the second part, Dr. Anurag will be talking about the research opportunities and some of the exciting uh, projects that he's dealing at Newcastle University, Singapore. So um, I'm going to the slides. Uh, uh, a little bit background about ourselves. Uh, my name is, is uh, Sumit and I'm a senior power system engineer at Amplitude Consultant uh, based in Singapore. I deal with the uh, power system modeling and uh, studies, analysis, and, and my experience is mainly in the Southeast Asia region, Australia and India. So typically I deal with uh, power system planning uh, problems or renewable integration issues or the normal uh, conventional or planned integration uh, related issues. And um, Dr. Anurag, uh, I would just give an introduction about him as well on his behalf. He's an assistant professor in Newcastle University, Singapore, and his main research include uh, energy management, DER, integration and application of various ancillary services, etc. And he's also serving as the vice chair of IGPLE Power and Energy Society, Singapore chapter. Uh, the, the overview of uh, this presentation. So the theme of the presentation is decarbonizing Singapore. So decarbonizing is a broader term which, which uh, deals with many, many uh, areas. I mean, uh, including our sector, logistics, uh, transportation, etc. But our focus will be mainly on the power se sector because we have a, a experience and also knowledge on uh, uh, this uh, power sector. So uh, to start with, I will start, give a context of uh, Singapore. I mean, what kind of a unique challenges Singapore has? This is important because uh, 
the theme of uh, decarbonizing is very common. I mean, each and every country in this uh, uh, in this current scenario has some other target, and they are trying to achieve it uh, in uh, near future. Similar, Singapore also has uh, its own uh, uh, targets and uh, uh, commitments, and it's, it's trying within the the constraint it has. And I will I will explain those constraints that we are facing in uh, Singapore. So uh, the, uh, after presenting a background of Singapore's power se sector, I'll be going through how the transformation of uh, power sector is happening, how it is going to be greener, uh, proposed to be a greener uh, power sector for the future. And, uh, and the, the third part will be on overarching goals for decarbonization. What are the related uh, decarbonization goals associated with uh, uh, this greening the power sector. And, and the uh, final portion, uh, we'll be discussing about the research opportunities ar arising from the this all uh, decarbonization efforts happening here. And also the related research in uh, Newcastle University in Singapore. So the first slide, uh, the, the going to the going to deeper. The first slide I have in, included uh, an overview of uh, what Singapore is. Uh, probably many of you uh, who are listening might have uh, come to Singapore or already know a lot of it. Uh, but I think it is important to understand uh, a bit more uh, in this uh, in this context. It's a small island with uh, just an area of. Uh, 725 kilometers square. And as closer to, is situated in Malay Peninsula, closer to Malaysia and uh, Singapore. And uh, you can see, I mean, on the right side, you can see the map and where it's located and it's barely visible from an uh, atlas if you, uh, if you try to search it. It's, that's why it's always ridiculed by some other uh, people like a, a little red dot. It's because it's, it's always uh, from a historic time, it is a busy port or busy uh, trade center, but it's barely visible uh, to people, but uh, there's always activities happening there. So if you look from uh, upside, it's all, always looking as a red dot. Uh, that's a little fun fact. And uh, this island, the, this small island has almost like a 5.8 million residents. It's uh, heavily uh, populated or populated density is uh, really high and 100 percentage is urban population and uh, out of which 90 percentage lives in high-rise apartments. So these things I'm highlighting just to, to, to give you a gist of how land constrained Singapore is. And uh, unlike many other countries uh, in this world, I mean, there's little uh, land or space available for putting up uh, solar or wind or those kind of plants over here. And uh, related fact is that this is a tropical country and that means it's a, get a lot of uh, solar throughout the year consistent, but at the same time it gets a lot of clouds as well. So cloud coverage happens uh, anytime. So that's another challenge to take in this uh, context. So moving into a bit, bit more into uh, electricity, electricity sector here. Uh, there's a market, functioning market, as called the National Electricity Market of Singapore, NEMS, which started in 2003. And the wholesale market clears at 30 minutes, which is operated by a company called Energy Market Company. Then uh, the, the, there are several generation companies, and I will I, I have a, um, a detailed present a slide on uh, how generation happening here. Uh, which is coming. And uh, following the generation, the, there's uh, only one transmission company, which is called the SP Group or, or SP Power Access, which owns and maintains the transmission grid. And the market, the retail market is fully liberalized in 2018. That means all the consumers uh, has a choice of uh, uh, retail if he or she decide to go with that. And the overarching, uh, the sector is regulated by Energy Market Authority, which also regulate that gas sector. 
So this is the overview of uh, electricity sector here. So some more details like the electricity generation, this almost like a 12.5 gigawatt of installed capacity of generation in Singapore, out of which overwhelming majority, which is 95.6 percentage is coming from natural gas, which is supposedly a, a cleaner form of uh, fossil fuel. Still, this is a fossil fuel uh, uh, that's mainly coming from CCGT, combined cycle gas turbine, open cycle gas turbine, and uh, steam turbine. The rest of the energy uh, or power installed capacity is uh, to two percentages from waste to energy conversion plant and also 2.3 percentages from solar PV. Uh, if you see the, the graphs on the right side, you can see the installed capacity from 2013 to 2020. Uh, the installed capacity is rather stable. I mean, there's not major uh, increase or decrease happening here. Uh, there's a slightly decrease over the years, but uh, uh, in the recent trend, if you look from 2019 onwards to, to the near future, it's supposed to increase a little bit more uh, due to increasing solar PV in the grid. And uh, the natural gas is uh, almost everything is imported and mainly from uh, the pipe natural gas from Indonesia and Malaysia. And uh, recently from 2013, Singapore is uh, importing LNG from uh, different uh, other places. So uh, if you see the overall generation picture as heavily fossil fuel uh, uh, focused, or there's a lot of uh, uh, historic reasons why it is uh, fossil fuel focus as well. Uh, Singapore has a very strong petrochemical background. It's a lot of uh, refineries around this uh, region and also in Singapore, uh, the country of Singapore. Uh, so the economy is also quite, uh, quite uh, 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 what do you say, intermingled or is uh, related to the, the petrochemical industry here. So, uh, and also the lack of land or space for putting up other uh, other generation plan also is one reason why Singapore has heavily invested in uh, fossil fuel. So uh, one one thing to know that uh, Singapore has uh, I have mentioned twelve point five. Uh, almost giga, gigawatt of uh, generation install capacity. But in the next slide is, this is a plot for consumption or the demand. The peak demand is only like 7.4 gigawatt. That means this almost like uh, double, not exactly double, but a slightly less than that uh, uh, generation available for each load demand. So there's a significant generation capacity available at this moment uh, and a lot of reserve uh, if, if uh, the, the market requires so. And the peak demand is will increase slightly to 8.5 gigawatt uh, by 2025 and was projected to increase by 9.43 by 2030. Uh, this, one thing which is not captured in this projection is the recent growth of uh, data centers. Uh, there's a lot of data centers coming up in this country and uh, which are typically energy intensive. So uh, there's an expectation that the demand growth will be slightly edge up uh, compared to the figures given in this uh, presentation uh, in this slide. So the overall consumption, uh, if you look at the bottom uh, high curve as, as the industrial load followed by commercial and uh, uh, household. And transportation also has a significant um, uh, uh, energy consumption in this, in this country. So uh, one, uh, I, 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 I would like to highlight the amount of solar PV in the system at this moment which is only like 
384 megawatt peak, which is rather relatively low compared to many other countries in this uh, in this over the around the globe. But uh, this has to this need to understand or this need to be taken in the context of available land space here. The entire 384 megawatt peak is from a rooftop solar. Uh, this, there isn't much available land uh, available for the grid connector, large solar plants in Singapore. At, at this moment, they're exploring or there's one uh, solar plant coming on, on as a floating reservoir. And there's some more space available uh, to explore in this area. And also there are some uh, on shore, I mean, uh, floating shore uh, solar plant uh, in initial talking stages. So, uh, but however, this 384 is already an achievement uh, for Singapore because they have set 350 as a target for end of uh, 2020, but uh, they have achieved this target already by uh, Q1 of 2021. So moving forward, I mean, uh, there's an ambitious target of uh, achieving two gigawatt peak of uh, solar plant by uh, 2030. So this is interesting scenario, like uh, how to achieve this, this uh, rather large amount of uh, solar in this given available space. So the more, uh, more opportunity or more uh, activity or more talks happening in, um, how to maximize the space or available uh, float uh, space in the floating uh, in the reservoirs, clean water reservoir within Singapore, and also nearby sea and or integrating the solar to building, etc. And also there's a possibility to to in, uh, install or the solar in nearby countries where plant is uh, the land is plenty and import directly to Singapore. But these, these are all uh, plants and there's no concrete uh, uh, project uh, maturing at this moment. So uh, this slide is uh, I, this bit uh, different from uh, the generation of the demand scenario I have presented earlier, but this is important to understand that uh, how the price or how the uh, sector is attractive for investment. So I have taken uh, energy prices as a benchmark for as uh, for the in, uh, the investment. So the uniform Singapore energy price is the half hourly energy price, which is cleared in the market Singapore Jose electricity market. Uh, this is a trend of uh, a price all the way from 2005 to 2020. You can see that from 2005 to, to 2012, the price was increasing. So this was a period where uh, Singapore rather had uh, limited uh, natural gas capacity imported uh, from Indonesia and uh, Malaysia. And there was virtually no LNG capacity over here. And also the uh, the number of or the amount of install capacity of the uh, gas turbine was also rather constrained uh, given the demand in this period. So it was a very good period for the new investment and then it was an opportunity for many people to come and invest uh, additional uh, generation capacity in Singapore. And this resulted, this combined with the uh, uh, additional investment in uh, in uh, importing natural gas via pipe uh, natural gas and also LNG resulted in a heavy overcapacity in the generation market. So after 2012, there's a rather declining uh, trend in the uh, energy price, wholesale energy price. So this means that the in, there's no rather rosy appetite for any invest, investor to come here to to install a large power plant. So this is important. Why? Because uh, this uh, this uh, initiative to to put more uh, 
solar and also to, to have additional cleaner CCGDs uh, in, the, in the power sector. So the overall sector need to address the issue of this uh, excess capacity vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the new decarbonizing effort happening. So uh, I hope that you got a flair of uh, what, what the sector has at this moment. And now I'm going to give a high level overview of uh, strategic directions for the industry, how it is heading to. So Singapore, many of you might know that there's a stable uh, political uh, system here with, uh, which, has, which is uh, known for uh, long-term planning. So they have a future of Singapore's energy story plan, which is a plan for 50, an upcoming 50 years uh, to transform the power sector to ensure a clean, affordable, and a re reliable energy future. So the question is, always like, how can we all overcome uh, this challenge? If it is, uh, as you all always might notice that the clean, affordable and reliable are three um, parameters, which doesn't go all together. So the strategic directions, they have uh, defined four switches for, uh, to power Singapore's future. And the first switch is natural gas which is uh, still a uh, fossil fuel. And the others, which is uh, solar. And then the third one is a regional power grid. And the final one is the low carbon alternative. So uh, I would like to discuss a little bit more about the, the switches. So many of you may think that, OK, you already have a natural gas and you're talking about decarbonization. Isn't it co contradicting? Yeah, I would say that, yeah, I can be contradictory because uh, I believe that even in the near mid or near the 50 year plan, natural gas is going to be the, the base or the most significant part of the generation mix. Singapore, uh, um, I, I reiterate, I mean, there's no land or uh, for or resources for putting up other cleaner or other uh, generation sources. And uh, there's no, absolutely no wind or other uh, uh, renewable resources. So there's only solar energy, solar PV as a cleaner source of uh, energy being explored. And uh, so you know that solar always come with intermittency and re related issues. So energy security is always behind the mind. So uh, the overall plan still think that, okay, natural gas is uh, going to be the base load or the base to balance the system. However, this natural gas uh, is a cleaner form and also they are trying to explore how you can uh, make it's even cleaner. So this link, uh, this first switch with the final switch, which, which is a low carbon alternative. So there are also a lot of uh, research uh, funding and also directions so, or uh, government imperative uh, exploring into how to reduce the emission level given the same uh, economic activity in the natural gas sector. So this means that uh, to capture carbon dioxide and convert them to useful products. And also another interesting thing uh, which is being explored is uh, using hydrogen as uh, complementing to the natural gas. So hydrogen can be produced uh, in a greener way or it can be imported from uh, other countries where it is uh, produced in a uh, cleaner way. So uh, this is a, uh, strategic plan to, 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 to keep the natural fossil fuel, but make it cleaner. So uh, you will see lesser emissions going forward. That is, uh, that is being the uh, future, of, uh, uh, future of the power sector. In order to, uh, to make it even uh, uh, cleaner or, or uh, affordable or reliable, they are trying to explore uh, solar. I mean, uh, there's already a two gigawatt peak of solar plant or, uh, projected for 2030, out of which they plan that 1.5 gigawatt peak 
should arrive by 2025. So this, uh, uh, the solar at this moment, I mean, it has already achieved a great parity in Singapore. It's around eight cent uh, Singapore dollar per kilowatt hour, uh, which is same or which is on same level for the natural gas production here, uh, which can be even reduced by uh, reduction in uh, the uh, the storage, also in the solar industry or the solar technologies. Also, they can uh, reduce. I mean, increase the solar. Uh, solar mix in the generation by uh, importing power from the regional power grid. So uh, this, there's also a link between the second and third switch. And the third switch specifically is uh, interesting. There's a lot of countries um, with a unique generation mix around Singapore, like uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Laos, Thailand, etc. Some of them has uh, abundant hydropower, which is very good for balancing uh, intermittency for solar. Uh, but uh, there's also need to understand that uh, different countries, there's no unique uh, political uh, or unique forum like what uh, is to do to make this in regional power grid happen overnight. So there's a lot of talks happening on uh, ASEAN power grid, but for many years, but uh, the, the progress has been a little uh, slow. And also the, now the countries are getting uh, interconnected, but uh, this uh, it's a universal or highly interconnected ASEAN grid is still uh, a dream uh, uh, in this uh, context. However, and recently they announced that uh, they will be importing 100 megawatt of uh, power from Malaysia as a, for a trial period of two, to, to understand how to, to play with the uh, imported power and how to increase it further beyond, uh, uh, beyond the 100 megawatt and uh, to, to make it a bit more robust. So um, these four switches, natural gas, solar, regional power grid, or low carbon alternatives, all come, can come with uh, uh, additional uh, energy efficiency factor on that. That means that all of these things can be done with a better technology or in a better way. That means everything can be achieved in, a, uh, in an energy efficient manner. So this is an overarching theme um, in all the sectors, and uh, there's also uh, research funding uh, from the government or various agencies to, to improve the energy efficiency of power production, also power consumption, and also encouraging the normal people to use uh, better equipment. So uh, this is the overall industry directions proposed by uh, government. And uh, uh, going a bit more, bit more uh, about these uh, directions, I mean, uh, to, to on a low carbon energy future, there are many more uh, branches, or I would say, um, shootout for uh, making a decarbonized, a decarbonized world. That is starting from, uh, I'm talking from the left, uh, left side of this diagram, uh, starting from living green. That means you can have a green transport or you can uh, consume uh, products on, or everything in a greener way and also produce those things in a greener way. This is, uh, I'm not going to talk uh, detail about uh, these things because uh, Anurag is going to touch a bit more a bit on this. But this is important because Singapore has uh, it's a major aviation and uh, shipping hub, and uh, government is already exploring how to make the ports even greener and also the shipping more greener. And also, there are also plans to extend it beyond shipping to aviation sector. Uh, so uh, this this picture what it shows that Singapore is trying to to uh, have a 
greener or uh, to to have a bright green spark of a future with a uh, with uh, living green uh, as an urban population which is living more green and also the power being produced in a greener way uh, which with a greener uh, energy mix combined with the storage and also greener energy production side and also a market which is facilitating all these things. I haven't talked much about the market initiatives here. So uh, going into this, uh, Singapore market is also enhancing a lot of features to, to, uh, to introduce more features which can uh, uh, give a confidence to, to the uh, investors on how they can plan a gre greener uh, energy mix in the future. And also uh, another feature for the market is that there's also already a carbon pricing existing in the market. Uh, and it is, there's also push to make it even more transparent to, to benchmark it with other carbon pric pricing mechanism over the world. So uh, this is the over, overall picture. There's a lot of uh, specific things being talked about and there's a lot of uh, uh, activities happening here. Um, um, due to a time constraint and um, we cannot go all into uh, all of those details, but uh, in the second part of presentation, there'll be some details being explored uh, uh, in detail. So uh, the, the overall idea about the decarbonization is always on how you engage the stakeholders so government has set directions, uh, which is consistent. We, as from an industry point of view, I would say this is uh, consistent over many years. There's no contradicting goals happening. And uh, we can also see the progress uh, progresses and uh, different milestone being achieved. And there's also one another uh, factor being talked is how to uh, upskill up the work workforce here, because mainly there's a, uh, fossil fuel uh, related industry here. If you are decarbonizing, you should be able to deploy the workforce to different uh, other sectors as necessary. So there's an upskill being planned and happening here. And uh, then the other stakeholders like there's also heavy involvement or encouragement for researchers and industry to, to participate and to, to innovate, to make the goals happen. And uh, also for the finally for different indi individual to, to uh, adapt to a cleaner energy uh, solution. So uh, this is the end of uh, my part. And then I will hand over to Anurag for talking about different research opportunities and uh, some of the interesting uh, projects that he's dealing here. Thank you. Uh, uh, for providing the base uh, for the presentation and uh, providing a background for Singapore. Uh, now that we know the industrial directions are laid and we are aware that Singapore is planning on transforming to a bright green spark, as you can see in the picture, uh, from a little red dot, let's look at like what are the research opportunities uh, it brings us. So. I will provide again an overview of each of the three directions which are mentioned, living green, what can be done, powering green, what can be done in green market structures, what are the things. And then I will uh, talk specifically about solar PVs and electric vehicles, what are the challenges, okay? So uh, coming to living green, uh, the idea is uh, to focus on smart buildings, how to incorporate natural ventilation and reduce use of air conditioners, which is a major energy consumers uh, in the residential and commercial sector. Uh, we, the idea is for green transportation to be there. Uh, for, by 2040, no ICE, no uh, internal combustion engine vehicle should be there. Charging points, 28,000 by 2030. Uh, these are like some targets which the government has assigned and logistics is another important sector where Singapore wants to manage the limited resources. Um, it wants to plan out the warehouses, how the, how the vehicles can travel, 
from one place to other. Okay, so all this thing will require a lot of research. For powering green, uh, as Sumit also mentioned, there will be an LNG requirement in Singapore, which we can foresee. So there is a lot of research opportunity available in increasing the efficiency of CCGTs, carbon capture, to reduce the harmful emissions. It is important to have a green energy mix. Uh, we want to uh, uh, stick to our Paris Agreement as well. So we have to focus on solar PVs, hydrogen, and energy storage systems uh, to increase reliability and maintain sustainability. Uh, the highly reliable grid structure of Singapore is also looking to be decentralized with involvement of pro prosumers and with uncertain load demands, especially uh, if you are looking into electric vehicles. In green market structures, the opportunity lies in the form of uncertainties and stability issues when power sharing in regional grid structure comes in. And uh, as Sumit mentioned, there is 100 megawatt sharing of uh, energy between Malaysia and Singapore, which is coming in the future. Having a forward uh, capacity market to ensure safety net for the investment when people are investing in solar or other forms of green energy, then you need a safety net. So a market uh, structure has to be developed and right carbon pricing. So carbon trading market is another thing which is coming up in terms of research, like you can do what sort of market structure should be there. In the context of Singapore, like a discussion on decarbonization will be incomplete. I have to say that if we talk, do not talk about solar PVs and electrification of transport fleet. And uh, when we talk about green energy mix, so solar power is one of the very vital component, especially for it for its impact on the grid. And Singapore aims to achieve uh, 1.5 gigawatt peak in 2025. And with its intermittency, the forms of energy storage uh, observed are very fascinating. So there is a chance that, uh, and Keppel is looking into offshore energy storage stack, which is a uh, very interesting uh, form of research, like for research, if I have to say. One of the major challenges Singapore has when we talk about solar in a green energy mix is that space. And as you can see in the picture, most deployment of PVs is on rooftops of high rise buildings. And when you have space country constraints, there are opportunities in terms of uh, solar applications urban solar applications such as mobile PV systems, which can be relocated. There is a possibility of offshore PVs. There is a possibility of building integrated PVs. And researchers are not only looking at this at a system level, they are looking at a high efficiency solar technology. So material research is also one of the things where Singapore is focusing on. There is impact on nature, so we need to be considerate about that, definitely. So co-location of PVs with greenery, which uh, that is another uh, opportunity which we have here in Singapore. And due to the space constraint that we cannot have large PV plants or large solar plants where which can be connected to the medium voltage level. So most of the uh, deployment is on the distribution side, which makes the intermittency issue more prominent. So being an island with humid conditions and sudden, sudden cloud concerns, uh, it, intermittency is one of, and I think intermittency is a concern everywhere, but in Singapore, it hampers the solar power generation a lot. Therefore, a research is required in terms of accurate forecast, use of energy storage, demand side management techniques. And when we talk about demand side management techniques, question can be whether it should be centralized or it should be user-based or decentralized. 
Another challenge which comes is to keep the cost of solar power, as Sumit mentioned, it's around 0.8 cents, uh, if I am saying correctly, at par with the normal price of electricity. And the government is giving a lot of opportunity in that sense uh, to consumers to buy renewable energy certificates and power purchase agreements are also allowed. So all this is to motivate the consumers uh, and providing them an opportunity to participate in sustainability. And with this deployment, how, what will be the impact on the grid? That is an interesting concern. In terms of managing PV grid integration, uh, Singapore is lucky uh, to avoid a duck curve, as uh, many of my friends in electrical power will know, because of a levelized power demand. And however, you can see, as you can see in this graph, you see that there are two ramps, one in the morning and evening ramp. These ramp structures are observed for two scenarios. One is the baseline. So one, the baseline was still okay, like you do not have a much large ramp. But for the accelerated case, in case there is a lot of investment in solar and uh, by 2030, the solar in increases, crosses the two megawatt, uh, 2.5 mega, uh, gigawatt peak, then the ramp rate challenge is so that's where we can look into having an energy mix, a flexible load demand. And with this, along with the target of electric vehicles, uh, because at the same time, parallelly, you have electric vehicles coming in. So all this mix, managing this mix is an interesting opportunity uh, for research. Moro, as the PVs, uh, I have mentioned here, like uh, lightweight inverters are required for rooftop and wall mount applications. Smart operation and maintenance is, can be done due to distributed nature of PVs. And there are regular challenges, which uh, we are have, like everywhere when you see and observe and talk about solar, you have ramp rate protection system, inertia reserve requirement. All these challenges are there. But along with that, maybe specific challenges are in terms of lightweight inverters for rooftop and wall mount, uh, wall mount applications. Moreover, when we want to go for large scale PV deployment, there is a need to develop a transactive platform for any interaction, especially when you are giving power to consumers to sell. So if we are looking into that direction, this will be very important. Recycling of PV, is very important in terms of looking into waste management and deployment of PVs um, in neighboring countries, as uh, Sumit mentioned. Like, we, and there is a plan. Like in with Australia, there is a possibility that Singapore can deploy PV there and then import the power through underground HVDC cables. So all this is giving uh, a boost to the concept of regional grid, which Sumit was talking about. So this was uh, about the solar PVs. Uh, in terms of green transport, if you see there is research requirement in terms of optimizing the transport network, um, especially for logistics because with minimum distance travel and minimizing road congestions. It is a complicated mathematical problem waiting to be solved. And a lot of data has been collected and is with the government and uh, they will roll out proposals to solve this issue. So this is all about green transport, logistics, moving people. But more importantly, maybe um, Thomas mentioned that fleet electrification is the focus maybe for our presentation today as well, and is one of the very important component. Singapore is focusing not only on electrification of land transportation, but also on aviation and maritime fleet. Maritime, there are a lot of grant calls which are coming in. And for aviation, just in today, I read, uh, and this news is very latest, that Volocopter, this is uh, all electric helicopter taxis, which can carry two riders, uh, is going to start from 2023. And I see this as a very good opportunity uh, and a very exciting time for electrification of vehicles. But I will focus maybe more on 
uh, land transportation fleet and mention some of the challenges um, and opportunities in that direction. So when Singapore, people talk about Singapore, Singapore appears to be an ideal urban test bed for EV adoption due to the short distances, which overcomes the range anxiety issue. There is support from the government in terms of subsidies and incentive schemes provided. There is an EV manufacturing plant coming up with Hyundai. And another challenge which we observe because uh, Singapore uh, is a bit expensive the, because of the COE or certificate of entitlement, then Hyundai is considering an option of rent and lease, leasing batteries. So the environment is there to support uh, the adoption of EVs. The vision uh, is to have all internal combustion engines replaced by 2040. But the current situation, if you will see, it's only 0.2% which are electric vehicles out of all the vehicles we have. And the number of charging stations, the plan is to have 28,000 uh, charging points by 2030. And currently there are 1,600. So a massive infrastructure requirement is there. And when we say the target for 2030 is 28,000, but our study, uh, it's not published yet, but our study says that uh, we what from our studies, we think that there will be more charging points required uh, if we want to work according to the growth in the number of electric vehicles. And therefore, there is a public and private partnership which is required and very important. And that's where, when we are talking about deploying or uh, providing infrastructure in terms of charging points, there is an opportunity to plan the charging locations with the constraints such as limited land area available, multi-level parking lots, uh, power requirements in clustered business districts. So if you can see on this graph here, you can see there are, uh, this is the additional load demand in central business districts. So these are different business clusters areas. You can see the amount of demand, power demand, which will be there when you have electric vehicles deployed. But in case you have uh, the residential areas having um, charging stations, then there will be a scattered distribution. So th the potential location can be placed here. So that's where the interesting part, the problem becomes more complicated and the research becomes challenging. There is a possibility, Singapore also has a shopping mall culture. So there's a possibility to, to have charging stations there. Different type of charging stations uh, is a possibility AC type two, DC fast charging. So this all makes the problem, the charging station planning problem, very interesting. And when it comes to adoption in public transport, we can have buses, which are a good choice because they have fixed routes and can have support from photovoltaics at bus interchanges and depots. So this is one of a very interesting issue which we are addressing here. For private hire vehicles and taxis, the, ta the question is, do they need dedicated charging locations? How, they how the private hire vehicles work in shifts? What will be the impact when they are converted to electric vehicles? And considering the dynamic gig economy, battery swapping or fast charging, which is a good option or viable option in Singapore, with delivery vehicles. So all these are number of viewpoints to consider the same electrification of land transportation issue. I do not talk more about what will be the power requirement challenges because I feel like we can manage because of the lot of availability right now we have, but with solar coming in with uh, distributed charging stations, this problem can be very interesting. Uh, and we are trying, so if related research at Newcastle University, what we, what we are trying to say is we are trying to solve it from solar forecasting perspective, um, planning perspective, siting and sizing of charging stations. We are looking into energy management and definitely 
resilient studies uh, with the new cyber physical system coming in, how the electric vehicles, as uh, Miriam mentioned, that communication will also become a part. So a cyber physical layer will be there uh, for electric vehicles and all this penetration is in the distribution level. So this becomes a very interesting problem uh, which we are trying to address here in Singapore. Uh, I have been doing a lot of research in terms of uncertainty handling and decision making. So yeah, I'm going a bit fast because of the time constraint uh, and planning and management of DERs. Uh, we are also looking into resilience and fault detection, identification and restoration. So these are a few of the areas which we are doing our work. If you want to contact us, you can contact uh, myself and Sumit. We are open for research collaboration, internships, and uh, even uh, writing proposals. Thanks, thanks a lot. If you have any questions, yeah. Arak Sumit, thank you so much for this extensive presentation. There were so many interesting things to learn. One of my favorite is uh, an insight you gave that someone maybe not living in Singapore in the area might not know it's called Dread Dot and now you're trying to make it a bright green spark. So thank you for that. And also it's interesting to hear about Hyundai wanting to build uh, a, a, a car manufacturing uh, plant in a, such a small space, but maybe because uh, car manufacturing is changing and, and electric vehicles might not need the big, uh, uh, like it's different, they need different supply chains, including maybe power electronics that you are known to be very good at in Singapore. Yeah. yeah. The one interesting thing I picked up is that you have 12.5 gigawatt of installed generation capacity uh, your uh, peak is uh, a bit half of that. So you have extra capacity. So you have 7.5 gigawatt of peak. And then right now you have 384 kilowatt peak of solar trying to get to two gigawatt peak by 2030. Is that correct? Okay, so uh, you've mentioned that right now most of the solar installation are happening on top of buildings because of the space restriction. Can you remind me where are you going to put the rest of this uh, planned solar installation? So uh, uh, there are quite a bit of land available as a floating reservoir because uh, Singapore also has an interesting fact, there's no water uh, uh, resource available. So they have, they have built an extensive network of uh, uh, clean water reservoir in Singapore. So there's land available there. So that's one possibility. And also there's also near shore installations being explored uh, in a bit more seriously. So these are the only two things uh, which can happen in Singapore, probably a little bit of uh, building integrated PVs. The more or any additional capacity required need to come from external uh, places uh, through energy import. So yeah, there, there will be a uh, hundred megawatt for two years, starting from uh, next year as a trial, and probably I expect that they will ramp up the power import uh, specifically for solar. And this 100 megawatt import of uh, uh, energy from Malaysia is preferably from solar or from any other renewable resources, but definitely not from uh, fossil fuel. Remind me why wind, offshore wind, for example, or offshore wind? Uh, uh, there's something I forgot to mention. I mean, there's absolutely no wind. Uh, um, you're breaking up. I can't hear uh, well your uh, sound. Um, um, there's something I, I didn't really mention in my presentation. Uh, there's no wind resource in this uh, belt or this region closer to equator. So yeah, uh, wind is not a viable source here. Let's see some of the questions. So uh, thank you for the brilliant presentation. Is there any discussion already in place on how to effectively increase DR participation in electricity markets? Uh, there, there are uh, things like uh, renewable energy certificates issued in the market at this moment. And also uh, the retailers, the electricity retailers also provide offer greener energy. Uh, if, if a consumer want to pay for that. So these are the two things happening at this moment uh, I, I, in, in terms of uh, electricity market. 
Okay. okay. Yep. The other question is, uh, do you have the data depicting the intermittency of solar in Singapore? Uh, I'm not sure whether, I mean, this, there are data available with the Research Institute and uh, uh, with the government, I'm sure, because we, we personally know that, but it's, if it is available for public, I can't be so sure. Uh, maybe I can, uh, we can check and uh, get back to you on that. Uh, but it should be available. At, I mean, if you pay for that, that's some mechanism that I, I, I know a little bit from uh, five years, it's a story from five years back. Uh, we can get back to you on this. Okay, maybe I can uh, for the participant to, to contact you directly. Uh, yeah, that should be okay. And the same is a question about the study on charging infrastructure. Anurag, when do you expect this to be published? Other than maybe by next year, maybe. maybe. Okay, great. Uh, a couple of more questions. So uh, in 2040, there are plans of no more ICE sales or no more ICEs on the road? Sorry, come again? No more ICE? Sales or no more ICE on the road? No more ICE on the road. Wow, okay. So so you're, you're probably wanting to ban the sales maybe sooner much sooner than that yeah 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 and what is the plan to ban the sales if the if no more uh, i see on the road in 2040 when is the ban on sales? 2030 it's 2030 generally the coe it depends on uh, the coe so it's i think 10 years bandwidth which is good. yeah okay interesting yeah. Too. and uh, you talked about uh, the location of charging infrastructure and we also talked about uh, the, the population uh, density and uh, most of the population lives in high-rise buildings. How will they charge their cars? So there are uh, multiple, uh, multi-level parking lots available uh, where you have your charging, where you park your cars. Yeah. And uh, yeah. if you do not have those multi-level parking lots, so that's, that's, that's where the challenge is actually. Like you have your dedicated parking spaces just near your high-rise buildings. So that's that's where the challenging part is. So for multi-level uh, charging, uh, charging parks, or oh, sorry, multi-level parking lots, you can have many charging points at the same location. So that's where the transformer might have overload and the new infrastructure might be required. But for where you do not have multi-level, where you have just parking lots available below your, where you are staying in the high rise buildings, there it should be where you are normally parking the vehicles. Okay. So, so we have, we have part done part part of Sorry? Can, uh, I'm saying you are, you, where you already parked the car, there is an opportunity to install a charging post. Yes, 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 yes. That That's the idea. And uh, we like, they, they, we are looking into like, you were, the idea for Singapore is that they want to have a 45 minute distance for your between your working place and where you stay. That's the kind of planning they want to have. So for this sort of arrangement, there will be your charging uh, point in your working place, charging point where you are staying and where, so it will depend. That's where the planning part is that where do you deploy, how many charging points do you deploy at which location? Okay. Um, and you mentioned uh, your public transport is really good. It's mainly buses. We, we lost you. We can't hear you. Um, it's mainly the train uh, subway network. For, yeah. uh, buses complementing that. Okay. So it's already electric mainly, probably. Um, yes. I mean, the subway is uh, electric, yes. Okay. Uh, do you foresee a lot of issues retrofitting those high-rise buildings to make them more efficient? Uh, you mean the charging issues? You no, know, no, just in general. You talked to one of the points of your move to become a, a, a bright green spark is um, energy efficiency in buildings. And you have those uh, high-rise buildings. Is it easy? Is it going to be easy to retrofit those buildings? 
building as such, they're not going to retrofit. Uh, it's only the equipment they need to retrofit here. So they're incentivizing those um, energy efficiency labels or high energy efficiency equipment. For the new buildings, definitely they will uh, design uh, yeah. with, with this consideration. The new ones, you mean? The new yes. ones, yeah. Okay, great. Okay. And um, last question. It, it seems that there are always challenges and you overcome the challenges, making you one of the most uh, thriving uh, uh, countries uh, with like space and you're finding ways to manage that with water, you're finding ways to manage that. What do you think is the key to this ingenuity in Singapore? Closing the question with less technical and more. Um, one thing is to understand that. Uh, I, oh, I can't hear you. I just really want to know. Uh, one thing to understand is that uh, most of the things, there's a uh, clear government planning, long term government planning. Uh, the, the high rise building that we are talking is also majority is built by government so they can actually tweak the template improve the template of doing that yeah and public transport is also owned by uh, government only yeah. the, the infrastructure so the improvements can are done in a centralized way and also it's a richer country at this moment so they they have resources to to make it happen this at this plan so yeah yeah, very good. Thank you so much. Well, again, thank you so much for the really interesting uh, presentation. Before we end, uh, where can people find more about you and uh, if there's anything you'd like to add? Uh, they can find us at this email address, uh, which is mentioned on slide uh, on the right hand side corner, both of us. And, uh, uh, and also, you can find us on LinkedIn. Uh, you feel can free uh, to connect, or you can shoot any question directly to uh, this email. Or, yeah, we are happy to respond to that. Great. Okay. Well. Okay. All right. Thanks, 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 a, thanks lot. a lot, Miriam, uh, for giving us this opportunity to present. Uh, My pleasure. Okay. Goodbye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.